the depth of the love of God. You can't just even fathom how deep it is. And sometimes it's hidden in instruction for our lives that we're going to talk about today. And as I was putting together the talk, you, generally what I do is on Mondays is when I start for the next week. And, and so I kind of have it mapped out in my mind about what I'm going to do certain times, but I get in the thick of it on Mondays. And so I'd done that. And on Wednesday night, overnight, I had kind of this nagging thought that I need to talk about Jacob and Esau a little bit. And I was thinking, okay, I wake up and Jacob and Esau are on my mind. And, and if, for those of you who are not familiar with the Bible, it's way back in the very beginning when, when some of God's uh, first chosen people were, were getting to where they were having children and, and the number was expanding. And Jacob and Esau were the sons, the twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah, and they had these two boys. Esau was the firstborn, and he came out, and um, he, was, he, was, he was really hairy. And they said he's kind of a red-haired guy, and they would tell us later on. And then Jacob came out as the twin, grabbing the ankle of his brother Esau. And so he was a totally different kid. Esau liked to hunt. Jacob liked to stay in the tents and cook and all of that. They couldn't have been more different. As they grew up, I was thinking to myself, why am I going to talk about this? Is this going to be the whole sermon? It's not. It's just going to be the setup to the sermon. It's really weird how God walked me through this process. And hopefully what I'm going to talk to this in this whole talk, will, it, will, it will all make sense when we kind of get to the end, okay? Um, so Esau goes out hunting. Esau is dad's favorite. He seems to be like the man's man. So Isaac naturally is drawn to Esau. He's a hunter. He goes out on a hunting trip. Jacob is mama's boy. And it says the mom favored Jacob. He liked to cook. And so whenever Esau went hunting one day, Jacob was back making stew. So when, when Esau comes back to the tent, he's starving. And he says, I'm famished. I'm about, I'm about to die. What are you cooking? It's kind of like when you go into a Mexican restaurant, you know before you go in, there is something good on the other side of those doors, right? It's just the, the onions and the cilantro and the garlic and it all hits you at once. And most Mexican restaurants, they, they just don't let you down, really. You know? So the, I'm thinking Jacob was this kind of cook and Esau enters the tent, he's starving. Jacob sees that he's got his brother who is much stronger than him at a point of weakness. And he offers this temptation. Jacob says, I'll give you a bowl of soup if you'll give me your birthright. And for us in, in our culture, we don't even think about what a birthright is. Like it, we kind of zoom past that if you're reading the Bible. But let me tell you how a birthright would work in this family. Say there are two sons. The inheritance the father would leave when he passed on would be divided three ways. You say, well, there's only two kids. Why three ways? Well, the oldest son got the double portion. So two-thirds would, would have gone to Esau. One-third would go to Jacob. So if dad's got 3,000 sheep, 2,000 sheep go to Esau. 1,000 sheep go to Jacob. Esau would have been set up from the get-up. He would have been in good if he had waited. But Jacob saw his opportunity. And Esau was hungry, and he couldn't even wait five minutes to go, or maybe another couple hours, just incredibly short-sighted. In this moment of weakness, he says, okay, I'll give you my birthright. And Jacob said, you swear? And Esau said, yes. In a moment of incredible weakness and incredible foolishness, Esau gives away the inheritance, the blessing that he would have gotten had he just had five minutes of patience. Now, why is this important to us today? I believe that God wants to bless many of you to a greater degree than you're currently being blessed right now. But I believe that many of you, that's why I'm preaching on this, are short-circuiting the process by going after an immediate appetite in an improper way. Like, you just can't, you, you've probably done this relationally. You know that that's not Mr. Right or Miss Right, but you go ahead and hook up anyway because you've got a need. Or you know that you can't afford to do that certain thing, but you also know that there's credit available, and so you go ahead and purchase that. You can't wait. 
You, and so we've all been victimized by, I got to have it now. That's why drive throughs work. Because we want it now. We don't want to wait for anything. So the Jacob and Esau paradox here. The story is kind of an American story. It's a problem for when we want it, when we want it, and most of the time we want it now instead of waiting for later. And sometimes the blessings of God that he wants to give us in our life are not instant oatmeal. They take time. They take faith. They take planting seeds in the ground. And, and when we plant seeds in the ground, they don't grow overnight. It takes some time. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to talk about the way it works in our financial lives. Because I know that God desires to bless us financially to a greater degree, many of you, than you've ever seen in your lifetime. And you're just like this far away. You say, well, pastor, I'm doing pretty good. I'm just telling you that there is a way to make sure that not only are you financially stable, but there is a way that you are stable the whole way around. Whatever you have in the bank is, is not your main thing. And we're going to look at a guy in the, in the Bible that Jesus talked to and in a story that he told, because all of us have to deal with this issue personally. Let me, let me give you an illustration. How many of you from some source get a paycheck on a weekly, monthly basis, would you just raise your hand? You get a paycheck from somebody. Somebody pays you, all right? For those of you who didn't raise your hand, you might be a dependent. You might be waiting on the other person that raised their hand, you know, whatever it is. But all of us are dependent on somebody's got to get paid. Because when you go into Publix, remember, you, don't, you just can't walk out and go, hey, I got a cart full of stuff. I can't pay for it. And it's like, you know, it's buy one, then get one free. You don't get one free. You got to buy one first. So we understand you got to have money. And the Bible gives us a whole lot of talk about money. In fact, there's a whole lot more talk about money than there is love. And you say, well, why is that? Well, it's, it's, it's a little easier to love things, but it's a little harder to deal with that issue of money in our lives. And there were some warnings that, that gives me the idea that the Bible saw this romantic attachment that people would have with money. In fact, there's the word in, in Hebrews chapter 13, 5. The writer said it this way. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Almost as if there's a, there's a personality involved here and it's a romantic deal. And it's like, man, I love to have money. And I don't know that there's any of us that hate to, you know, hate to be like, you know, pockets full of cash. I just don't know that there's anybody in this room that way. But Jesus said, be on your guard. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Here's what he says. You can't serve both God and serve wealth. He didn't say there's anything wrong with wealth. He said you can't serve them both. So, so let, me, let me get to our scripture today. If you're following along and you've been keeping up with your life journal, you'll know that we're in the book of Luke this, this month. And uh, Luke chapter 12 has something that, that Jesus wanted to confront right off the bat. When, when he looks around at the United States, I, I'm sure he would look at a lot of people that have a lot of stuff. And someone in the crowd, it says in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, Jesus was teaching. So someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. In other words, they were having a family money issue. Now, this is pretty common, apparently, when people die. You know, there's an estate, and there's, there's an executor, and there's usually squabbling among families. This is nothing new. It happened back in Jesus' day. And Jesus said to him, friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbiter over you? Like, I am not here to settle your fight. You guys deal with that. But then he went on. He said, take care. Be on your guard against all all kinds of greed for one, one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And that was really interesting lead in because then he tells this story of a guy that did. He said, uh, they told him this parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. So here we have a farmer. He's got a bumper crop. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Life's good. Woohoo! Then he said, I will do this. 
I will pull down my barns and I will build larger ones. I will store there my grain and my goods and I will say to my soul, soul, I love that, like first person. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years, relax. Eat, drink, and marry. Early retirement sounds like you. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And then Jesus hits the zinger. So it is. With those who store up treasures for themselves, but not rich toward God. Very critical you understand that sentence. That, that scripture says it all. Now, he was, he, was, he was busting a few myths, Jesus was, about wealth. Because Jesus doesn't have a problem with wealth. He knows that we do. See, this, the first myth is that, that I don't need to consult God when things go my way. Like, if I get blessed, if, if, I, if I'm experiencing a, a, a windfall of a year, if everything I invest in goes to up and to the right, if I'm just having one of those decades where it's raining blessings on me, I don't need to talk to God about that. And this parable shows that a man thought, without asking God, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to know what I'm going to do next. And this is no small project. He just thinks he's fortunate. Man, I've had a great run. I know what I'll do. I'll add another investment. I'll add another this or that. And, and, and he thinks it's up to him to solve the issue. I think that's a myth that as Christian people, we understand we also have divine help available. The second myth is all my blessings are for me and mine. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll be, build bigger barns for me. And then I'll take it easy and say, soul, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the way to live. We're living now. And Jesus isn't talking about having a lot of stuff. He's talking about greed. And greed isn't just a rich people problem. You can be greedy and be broke. And you can be wealthy and be extremely generous. It's, it's not really according to what you have. Greed is no respecter of income level. It's an attitude of the heart that says, I just need a little more. More, 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 more. And that's what you live for. And, and the third myth is the most noble goal for life is material comfort and ease. He said, you fool. Don't you know all that you've been saving for? You're going to die tonight. Now, who's going to get it? The Romans had a proverb which said, money is like seawater. The more a man drinks, the thirstier he gets. You know, Princeton did a study about uh, 11 years ago on what it would take for the average person to be happy. How much money? And so they did a, they did a statistical analysis and they did a lot of surveying. And they said that uh, at that time, it was $75,000 was the mark that if you earn $75,000 per year, that more than that would not make you one bit happier. And they had a way of proving it and they showed it you know, empirically that that was the number, that if you make less than 75,000, then you do have more issues that come at you. But, but once you hit that number, today's dollars, it's $86,000. So that's the number where if you made $860,000, you wouldn't be one lick happier. And some of you are saying, you know what, though, I would really like to find out, you know, you know, because I really want to verify. But I get it. But here's the number that they said, there, that there is a number. And then the warning in this parable is not about having wealth. You can be godly and have wealth. There's no sin in having money. Theologian John Wesley, you know, the Wesleyan church and the church of Nazarene, all of us owe our roots to Wesley. He would say, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. So earning is not of the devil. It's not, you know, I know in our culture, we like, to, we like to demonize people that have great wealth, which is kind of silly to me. A lot of times they work to get where they're at. And we value hard work as Christian people, amen? Nothing wrong with earning wealth. It's what you do with it that Jesus was addressing in this thing. And he said, you guys, this guy was a fool when he, when he only looked to earn more for himself. He didn't ask God's guidance, and then he died. The Spanish have a proverb that says, there are no pockets in burial shrouds. And so Americans, what we do is we just pretend nobody dies. Oh, I hate funerals. 
You ever said that? Like who likes, nobody likes funerals. Get over yourself. You're there to honor the family that just lost a loved one. So get there if you can. But you know what funerals do? It reminds us all of the, that we have a 100% chance of someday our heart's not going to beat and we're going to die. And so we as a church body, we come together every once in a while with that. It's not a morbid thought. It's just the truth. And so we have what we have in this moment. Everything in, in the world belongs to God. He's given us something to manage, a family to manage, cash that will be in our pocket for a while and somebody else's later. It just moves around. You know that, right? The money that you have now, it's going to be somebody else's someday. It just moves. You manage it for a while. And that's what, what Jesus was trying to get across to us. In fact, Paul wrote this to his young pastor friend, Timothy. He said, Timothy, he says, it's the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil. Remember, he didn't say money's the root of all evil. He says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Some have wandered away from the faith. Okay, parents, I want to talk to you for a minute. Some of you that have older kids who have wandered away from the faith or they've deconstructed their faith and they don't know how to rebuild it. I'm going to give you a passage I think speaks to their need to how to rebuild it. But I think why their faith breaks down many cases is this verse right here. In their desire to be rich, some have wandered from the faith. They have, maybe, maybe it's because you've taken such good care of them financially. Maybe you, you've taught them good stewardship. And maybe they're not running from that. But maybe some are. That you've placed the dollar ahead of anything else. And they've watched that in you. And they emulate themselves in a life after you more than you want them to. Just as a way of, of, of saying, okay, some of you with young children or, or pre-children, some of you that are about to get married, I want you to have a relationship with money that will set you up for success for the long term, that will help your children see that God is real, he is alive, and will help you financially when you need it. I'm telling you over and over, I was raised this way, and I understand that I could not verify the existence of God, but I watched God's faithfulness financially to my family, who when we didn't have much, when God came through over and over and over, I could not deny the reality of a God who made our finances stretch when it made absolutely no sense for my mom to give, and she gave, and I watched it happen, so I knew God was real because I saw him at work work in their life. I saw the way that they trusted him. So parents, I, if you want to bring your kids back to faith, I am going to just tell you, I'm going to challenge you, extend your faith further than you've ever extended it before. And let your kids see you begin to walk by faith out on the water. When Peter got out of the boat, and the Bible tells us a story, when Jesus is walking on the water and Peter's like, hey, that looks fun. Jesus, tell me to come with you. And Jesus said, get out of the boat, Peter, come on. And for a little while, Jesus, Jesus and Peter both walked on the water. But when Peter looked around, he saw the wind and the waves. He saw his circumstances. Then he became overwhelmed and he began to sink. And Jesus pulled him up and said, you have little faith. You had it. You were surfing like me. This was awesome. And what I want some of you parents to see and some of you pre-parents to see is when you live by faith out of the boat, you give other people a chance to see what faith walking looks like. It looks like a lot of fun. But it doesn't come without effort. It doesn't come without oral testimony. Your kids need to hear the stories of how God has come through for you. Okay, that's enough about parents. Some of y'all are pre-parents. And I want, to give you the, I want to give you the framework for how God had planned to bless his nation Israel and the framework for how he wants to bless us today the same, the same way. And it starts with this verse. Look at verse 6, Malachi chapter 3. For I the Lord... Do not change. Everybody else might change. The things that I think are a big deal, they don't change. I, the Lord, do not change. He starts with his constancy as he sets us up for his financial plan for our life. He says, therefore, you, O children of Jacob, 
have not perished. Since I don't change, I should, have, I should have put you guys down a long time ago. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statues. You've, you've not kept them. But return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you, you say, how shall we return? Like, I thought we were already doing this. How shall we return to you, God? Aren't we showing up for worship? Aren't we doing our bit? And he says here, Verse 8, will will anyone rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings, he says. You're accursed with a curse. You're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Okay, so he's saying to people that were his chosen people, the nation of Israel, were supposed to show the rest of the world what it looks like to live under God's rule, Okay. They were supposed to give the first 10% of their income to God, keep 90% for themselves, live off of that, and what would come of that is the nation would be blessed, all sorts of good things would happen, but they weren't doing it. They were hit with the same temptations that you and I face on a daily basis. I cannot afford to do this. But he says, you're, listen, you're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe, the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. So the promise is, if you'll bring the tithes to the Lord, bring it to the storehouse, just leave it there. It doesn't belong to you. You're robbing God, but you're not robbing God of his money. He's not saying you're robbing me because it's already his. How can you take from God what already belongs to him? He's, he's allowed you to steward it for a while. You're not robbing him of his money. You're robbing him of a chance to bless you. So you're robbing yourself when you don't give 10% of your income to the Lord. I'm telling you, it's his framework then. I, the Lord, do not change, he says. It's the same framework now. Now, here's what happens if we do give. I'll open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour down for you an overflowing blessing, not just a financial blessing. I got I to gotta overstate that because some people just see this is about money. This is about all of life. Look at this, verse 11. I will rebuke the locusts for you. So if a locust is coming to your field and you're the ones given, I'm going to send them to the neighbor's field that isn't given so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil and your vine in the field shall not be barren, said the Lord of hosts. So a lot of their, their work was agrarian work or they had sheep, you know, and your sheep is going to outlive their sheep. I mean, this is the way it goes. Then all the nations will count you happy for you will be a, del- a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. So his, his plan for the nation was that they would stand out among all the other nations as people that God really did bless. Because all the other nations around them, if you look at Israel on the map, I mean, it's not the most fertile territory. So for this to be true of that little dirty, dusty, deserty kind of place, God had to get involved. And God even changed the weather patterns to make sure that his people were gonna get whatever they needed to get. And so when I look at this, And I'm looking at Jacob and Esau, and I told you I was going to bring it all together here in a minute. Esau had a birthright to get a double portion of his father's blessing, but he gave it away because of short-sightedness and a lack of personal discipline. He decided, you know what, I got to have a meal now. I got to eat, you know, I'll give you what, I'll give you my blessing or my birthright. You know, it's, I can't, it's no good to me now. And that kind of short-sighted thinking took over Esau's life and became him the person that God couldn't use. God chose Jacob instead, and Jacob was kind of a thief. He would go on to steal the blessing from his brother. He was a no-good character in the Bible, and God got a hold of Jacob because there was something in his character that was was okay with the idea that that God was really the one he could trust. So I want to give you or inject three ideas for your money and my money because these these are things that Mindy and I live by. Number one, I will repent if I've robbed God of an opportunity to bless me. I'll just say, you know what, God? I know. That stimulus money came in, 
and you are not on my list. And so you repent and go, okay. You know, I, 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 and, and, and when you look in this room, so many of you do this already. I know that. And so I'm preaching to the choir. But for many of you, this is one of your biggest struggles with not only yourself, but with the church. Because when the church comes with this kind of message, you do this. Ah, you're one of those places. They're only after my money. And you don't understand that the way to financial freedom is by obeying God. And when you do that, he blesses the rest of your life. I'm not after your money. I don't need your money. God's taking care of me whether or not you give or not. I'm telling you that because you know why? I'm faithful to give back what his, is, is his, and then he takes care of me however he sees fit. And he'll do the same for you. You won't have to worry. Beth LeBrandy came up in the nine o'clock service and she was just sitting out here. Beth, Beth's not here anymore. Is she, she's back at work, working with the kids. Okay. But she just talks about how they live, you know, at a very low level, level of income, below middle class. But she said they learned over 30 years ago in their marriage that we would always, always tithe. And, she, and Beth, honestly, is one of the happiest people I've ever been around. She exudes the joy of the Lord. And when it, when it came to talking about giving, she jumped up on, here on stage when we had our prayer time before the 9 o'clock service. We have a prayer time at 8, eight o'clock. And she's like, you guys, I just got to tell you how faithful God has been to us. We don't have much, but we have enough. And he's never, ever let us down. And I'm like, wow, there's somebody that's, that's speaking to the issue. I, I know that's true. And so I, number two, we'll trust God with the whole tithe. I do this. We do this. We give more than 10% to the Lord. And, and God continues to bless us as a family. He's, he, I've watched my own family. My mom and dad do the same thing. And so when you see, bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. When you give, it's not that you're giving to the church. This is an act of worship. You know, worship that doesn't cost you anything isn't really worship. Worship that doesn't cost you a dime or, I mean, just think about this. Okay, you go to Applebee's, you sit down, you eat a great steak meal, and then you just say, hey, you know what? Um, see that guy over at table 16? He's going he's to go ahead and take care of my bill. Now, the guy at table 16 has no idea that you just put your check onto his check and you get up and you walk out. And that's what a lot of people do on, at church on Sunday. You get fed and God is taking care of your, your spiritual needs and you, you never give a second thought to the fact that you're leaving the bill for somebody else to take care of. So when we as a church body put our resources together, we pool our resources, it's because we are doing it as an act of worship. We are saying that we are not going to serve wealth. We are not going to serve the God of this world. We are going to serve the one true God that made everything possible in, on this planet, and we're going to do so with faithfulness. We're not going to give because we are mad and like, oh gosh, I got to tithe. We're going to do it with a grateful heart because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver because he is so generous to us and look at who God is generous toward you look around the world and it rains on everybody crops grow for people that don't even think of God one bit God is so generous to all of our world and so when he asks us to give 10% back to him it's a way of like you know what I'm going to do it and see what happens that's why he says test me in this the test is for you it's, do I believe the Bible is true? Do I take God at his word? If I, if I trust God for my salvation and I'm gonna to go to heaven when I die, why wouldn't I trust him with a little bit of money here while I live? So if I'm putting the same amount of faith in the Bible to be true when it comes to my eternal destination, why wouldn't I just use the same effort and logic to say, well, if it's true this way, it's gotta be true this way, I'm gonna believe the whole thing. And so I, I expect God, thirdly, to honor my obedience. When I obey God and do whatever it is he tells me to do, I know that he'll take care of me. He'll take care of mine. He'll take care of my family. Because when we bring our tithes to the storehouse, we enable this church to feed people who are far from God. And I, I got to tell you, I know some of what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, you know what? I can't afford to give. I mean, I would like to. I mean, I, I think you're making sense. But I don't know. You know, I had a grandma once that gave to a televangelist, you know, and he, he took all our money. And I just think, you know, given to religion, that's just kind of 
That's kind of a scam. And I, I know that's in some of your hearts. I've heard it. But then I, I've heard these other voices. Like after the first service of a single mom who said she'd never ever given to God because she couldn't afford to. And her child saw the amount she was giving and said, we can't afford that. And she said, no, we can't afford not to. That's the story of those of us who give consistently, who tithe just because that's what we do, because we're one of God's kids. We would never, ever go back to the old way when we were doing it on our own. Now we have the covering and the favor of God's, God on our finances. So if the market takes a wrong turn tomorrow, if everybody sells their stock and everybody from Wall Street is jumping out of buildings, you know what? I am going to rejoice in the Lord because he is my savior. He is my light. He is my salvation. I am not counting on a 401k to be there when I get old. I am counting on the Lord of host to come through and honor the promise that he made when he said test me in this and see if I won't pour out the windows of heaven just kind of bless you more than you've been blessed and I'm telling you until you experience it until you jump in you'll never know the faithfulness of God the one way you can prove the existence of God is to give to the Lord and let him honor his word in your life prove him test him he'll come through every time amen you're going to grow in faith when you do that. My faith will grow when I give to the Lord. My anxiety will decrease when I give to the Lord. My abundance will grow when I give to the Lord. It's like planting seed. I plant one seed, 10 things come up. That's the way it is when you use God's math. It makes zero sense on paper, but every month he comes through over and over and over. And if that's true in your life, can I get a witness? All right, you give Lord praise. He has come through in your life. So where is your heart when it comes to wealth? Is your heart hard when it comes to generosity? You know, A.W. Tozer said one of the greatest tragedies is that we allow our hearts to shrink until there is room in them for little beside ourselves. And you see this on social media, right? Everybody creating their own building, they're building their own brand so that people will look at them and nothing wrong with any of that. I'm just saying, if that displaces your heart for other people, if that displaces your love for God, then it maybe has drawn your worship. And you begin to worship yourself. And your whole life becomes about, what about me? Just like the guy that was in the crowd. Hey, Jesus, I know you've got the words to eternal life, but would you settle a financial dispute in my family? How silly that seems to us, knowing who he is. I know that you've got bigger questions of God, but there's no more important question <laughs> after your salvation that you're ever going to answer is, how should I use the wealth that God has entrusted to me? And my prayer for you is that you will begin to honor him with a tithe if you're not already doing so. Start there. If you're already doing that, Go on to step two and keep giving as you see needs around you. And when I'm telling you what, the more you give, the more God replaces. It's just, it's just like a fountain. Father, I, I love these people. I love them so much. I am so humbled that you give me a chance to speak life into their hearts. And Holy Spirit, I know that you put this message in my heart today because... You know there are some people in our room and online that are living like Esau. They're living for today only and they're not thinking of tomorrow and they're not thinking of how to invest what you've given them wisely. Some in this room are like the man with the barn and life has been so good to them that they've just, con they just continued to, to pile up wealth and they've never given you a second thought. So Lord, I pray that you would get a hold of their heart as well to remind them that it's all yours. And as they honor you and, 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 and as you speak to them on where to use their wealth, maybe some of them have been very faithful over the years to tithe and now they're, they're reaping the abundance, but you've got greater plans for the wealth they currently have. You want to alleviate the debts of other organizations around the world or you want them to help and write big checks for your glory. I don't know who that is in this room, Lord, but you know 
who they are. And so, Lord, we come to you with open hands and say, Lord Jesus, take what you want. It's all yours anyway. And Lord, I know you're going to leave in our hands more than we need because you love us so much. In your name we pray. Amen.